Welcome to Reflections with an Accent. Imagine walking in a forest and finding a new species. Our guest today, discovered the golden bamboo lemur, in what is now known as the Rano Mafana National Park. Never stop dreaming because if you don't dream, nothing happens. If you're going to change the future, which I hope you will, in a better, to be a better place, uh, you have to dream about how you're going to do it. Nature is so important to all of us, and it's on the brink of extinction, and, and we need to do all we can to protect it. And so I dream of a future where there's natural forest, beautiful animals, and lots of people like you to there to help save them and to, for the future. Welcome to Madagascar. Dr. Wright's work as a tropical biologist, conservationist, and primatologist not only led to the discovery of a new species of lemur, the golden bamboo lemur, but also the establishment of Rano Mafana National Park. Her work with lemurs in Rano Mafana was featured in the films Island of Lemurs, Madagascar and Me and Isaac Newton. You should watch this interview until the end, to discover how she was featured in CNN's Parts Unknown with Anthony Bourdain, or why a Jimi Hendrix concert changed her destiny forever. Hello dreamers, in this video we will be diving into the mysteries of Madagascar and its lemurs hand in hand with Patricia Wright, an American primatologist, anthropologist and conservationist. Hello Patricia, it is a pleasure to have you in this channel. Thank you for accepting this invitation. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Okay Patricia, so let's start with a very simple question. What do you know now? you wish you knew then oh that's not so simple i know there's so many things there's so many things but mostly i i would have liked to know then that it was going to work because there were so many problems and you're trying to find a solution and you're not sure that you're going to be able to do it and it's very uh, nerve-wracking but now i know yes after 35 years we did it <laughs> And I want to play a, a, a very simple game. I'm going to give you some words um, and I want you to give me the first thoughts, memories, lessons or experiences that cross your mind and I want you to elaborate slightly on the topic. So the first one is Ranomafana. Ranomafana. It means hot water and for me it means the fourth national park in Madagascar. The place where I fell in love with lemurs. Uh, Jimi Hendrix. Oh, well, a fantastic guitar failure, as we all know. But also, if it wasn't for Jimi Hendrix in a concert I went to a very long time ago in the 60s in New York, I probably never would have be where I am today. Because just before we went into the Jimi Hendrix concert, we went across the road from the Fillmore East And there was a pet store called Fish and Cheeps, and that's where I saw my first monkey. And it was from that time on that I became a primatologist. I wanted to study that monkey, and I did. Uh, if I say the word princess. Oh, princess. One of my lemurs. The lemurs are, are, are beautiful, beautiful animals, very regal and royal. And so Princess is a very good name for one. Okay, is, is that also a name that is referred to mention the female in, in lemurs? You know, females always, in, in lemurs, females are dominant. They lead. And they are also uh, very princess-like. They like to have everything just the way they want it. 
So to name the lemur princess is just a, it's very natural. If I say the word sifaka. They're kind of lemur, but they have incredibly long legs and they can leap great distances and they're beautiful and they're very, very kind of zen. They have a quality about them that's very otherworldly, beautiful. And I've studied the Shafakas in Radamafan for 35 years now and seen them through their whole lifetimes. It's wonderful. Romasaba. That's a really good meal that Malagasy's eat. It's like, it's a, Romasaba is a, is a, like a kind of stew that you put over rice, but it's only found in Madagascar and it's just delicious. So, you know, my mouth is wa wa watering just thinking about having a good meal of Ramazava again. <laughs> If I say library, or, or let me say librarian. Well, you know, my mother was a librarian. And I have two sisters, both of them are librarians. And my mother uh, taught us very early to, to read books and to uh, enjoy the worlds that the books could bring us to, even if we did live in the countryside and we couldn't travel anywhere. It's interesting that I chose random words and you have things to say about them. It's, it's kind of interesting. And the last one is Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain, of course, is a TV star who started out as a chef. And he called me up one day and said that he wanted to come to Ron the Farm. And I said, sure. I knew his show. And so I knew that he was going to really want to know about food. And so I explained to him that in Madagascar, you know, rice is the most important food of the local people. But when they have a special ceremony, they actually kill a, a cow and they eat the cow as part of the ceremony. But they just don't, don't, it isn't just the elders that eat the cow, they also invite people, but people from before. So we call the ancestors in one by one from the east, because that's where the ancestors go when they're not at a, a ceremony or a festival. We call them in one by one. And so Anthony Bourdain was there. We were in the forest. We were celebrating a special time when we were converting some fields into a conservation area. And, uh, and we were bringing the ancestors back one by one. And then we served Anthony's food. And I thought, I wonder if he's going to really like this because, you know, the elders, the most important people at the ceremony, get served the hump, which is a big wad of fat, the hump of the zebu, the hump of the cow where the fat is stored. But he was a really good sport, and he, he ate it, and he said, hmm, I would have put some cloves in this recipe, but it's, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> very funny and, and very charming, and he was with us for four or five days. It was. How would you describe Madagascar to someone who has never been there? It's difficult to s describe Madagascar to somebody who hasn't been there because it's such a special world. It's not like anywhere else. It's, you know, been isolated in the middle of the Indian Ocean for something like a hundred million years, a long time. And so all the animals that are on Madagascar are totally different than any animals that we know about or have experienced before. But there's also lots of different habitats. You know, there's extraordinary rainforest, There's the dry forest, there's the mangrove forest, there's the, uh, you know, the coral reefs, which are really like forest, the spiny desert, the baobab forest. There's all these different kinds of habitats. So it's difficult to describe Madagascar easily, other than it's a naturalist paradise, a beautiful place, and amazingly rich in biodiversity and poor when it comes to human economics. What is so special about lemurs? Lemurs, they are our most ancient cousins. 
You know, they're like, before we had monkeys, before we had apes, before we had humans, they're still, we're lemurs. And it's so interesting to, to look into their eyes and you see, you know, the ancient past of our earliest ancestors. Lemurs are amazing. Lemurs, because they have such a long history and such a deep history of something like 65 million years ago, they actually first appeared on this earth, that, you know, they have, they have, they, they look like they, they look very wise, like they really know more than we do. Everybody, I think, likes lemurs. They believe they're cute, but I wonder how much do they really know? Can you share with us five fun facts about lemurs that probably people are not aware of? I sure can. Uh, five fun facts. Okay. So do you know, if these are primates, right? Do you, our, our, our relatives, do you know that with some lemurs, sleep half their lives away they go into hibernation like bears and they sleep through the winter months and they're closely related to us so that's quite a trick so that's one thing that they can do that we can't quite do do you know that lemurs have a special kind of comb that they bring around with them all the time so that's why they always look so good <laughs> <laughs> it's in their teeth they have something that's called a tooth comb And instead of, uh, you know, combing their hair, they actually use their tooth comb to groom each other. And that's why they look so good all the time. They also can use that tooth comb to dig into a, a tree and, and extract insects or sap or all kinds of things. So it's a tool that they bring around with them. So that's two things. Do you know about the stink fights? That they can do? Oh, my goodness. They That's have. what I'm asking you, you know, Patricia. I, I want to <laughs> learn. <laughs> well, they are very, they have an acute sense of smell. And when they like to, uh, they like to anoint their territory with their own special scent. And then also, you know, there's other groups other than your home team. And so... The other groups sometimes want to encroach on your property. You don't want that. So what you do if you're a lemur is you take your really long tail and you take the glands on your wrist and you rub the tail with this beautiful smell that comes out of these glands. Then you take your tail and you lift it over your head and you start to wave your tail like that so that the smell gets distributed. And All of one side gets lined up on one, on one one side of the playing field, and the other group is on the other side of the playing field, and they're all wafting their tails at each other. It's hilarious to watch, but they're very serious. Don't laugh. They're very serious about this. And then all of a sudden, they start to run at each other with their tails waving. And it's it's warfare. It's serious warfare for them, but it's hilarious to watch. Okay, so that's three. They have stink fights. They have tooth combs. Some of them hibernate. Some of them, the bamboo lemurs, they eat bamboo, which is not so unusual, except in that bamboo, there's toxins, cyanide. Cyanide is a poison that if you eat, you just die because it actually suffocates your cells. But this incredible bamboo lemur, there's two species of them that can eat cyanide all day long. And they do. And they're perfectly healthy and happy and, and there's no problem at all. So they have these secret ways that they can detoxify some of these poisons that they're eating. All right, so that's four. And then I guess the fifth one is the fact that they are such magnificent acrobats. They can leap, you know, tall buildings at a single bound. I mean, so, tall trees, baobab trees, you, you name the tree, and they have these incredible legs that allow them to jump from tree to tree. And so they're quite good at that. And they do have two tongues. One tongue is under the other, and that helps them to detect uh, the poisons and detect the taste of the fruits that they want to eat. It's very interesting. That uh, 
they have these special special qualities what has been your most spiritual experience in nature i think i think being in nature is very spiritual all the time i mean when you're sitting there next to a waterfall it's just like and the birds are singing and the lemurs are leaping them and it's just beautiful but i think the most spiritual time was actually when i was in the amazon when i was walking along a trail and suddenly i was face to face with a jack an incredible animal and the two of us just stood there and stared at each other and i thought well this is this is probably it <laughs> and uh, and i was very spiritual and i prayed that it wouldn't be <laughs> and he went the other direction and i was fine and so was he that's a, an amazing encounter that you had to experience not not, not so common no i was a uh, I wasn't even afraid really at first but then later I thought oh my gosh <laughs> but but let me tell you something interesting Patricia many of the people that I have interviewed they have had close encounters with jaguars mm. uh more than one more than two and more than three people that obviously they work on the field so the odds are there but it's not so easy anymore no. Yeah. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about your uh, field experiences with the lemurs and also some of the memories working with the silky sifakas. How was that first encounter and all those moments you spent uh, tracking them, I guess, and studying them? I mean, lemurs are, the first lemurs that I saw just ran away. And so I had to spend some time, you know, getting, gaining their trust. Really, they had been hunted, and so it was really important we had that they trusted that we weren't going to hunt them or harm them in any way. But then, once they decided that I was okay, they became quite easy to follow, and I would be underneath them, of course, and they would be jumping in the trees. They always knew I was there, but they, I, I didn't really interfere with their behavior. They went along and. They did their eating and their jumping and their sleeping and their grooming and their fighting everything like they would have if I wasn't there. Um, the shafakas are such beautiful animals, and when you you see them, it's like uh, it, it's um, they're almost like the silky shafakas are almost like ghosts. You know, it's like they have an aura about them. Um, they live high in the mountains, and it's misty, and then suddenly there it is. There's this beautiful animal. And, of course, they do, their shafakas always come in groups, and some of the groups are, you know, only a small, like three animals, and some of the larger groups are nine. But they're always, uh, they, they call, and they, and they jump, and they, and they interact with each other in ways that are, are just beautiful to watch. I mean, I'm taking data, and it's a real science project, you know, there's no questions about that. I've watched them and throughout their lifetimes. But it's also, it's an amazing thing to watch such a beautiful animal. And how many species of lemurs are there in Madagascar today? Well, the books say that there's 110, 110 different kinds of shifakas. But I know there's 111 because <laughs> we're about to describe a new species. So that's pretty exciting. I'm sure. Can you talk about that or we should not? Well, you know, you know, we thought, well, all right. So I'll tell you that it is a mouse lemur and that we were, you know, thinking that it was one species. And then we started, you know, following them. And there's, you know, they're. They're doing some different things, but we just thought it was, you know, variation. And then we looked at their genes. And their genetic differences divided them right into two groups. And there's no way that the two groups are the same because one is a deletion of a whole series of genes that aren't there. And they seem not to hybridize. So they're living together in one place 
but they're not the same species. So th that's going to be an interesting paper. Yes, mm -hmm. so there's 111 species of lemurs. Beautiful, all of them. Well, almost all. Thank you. Thank you for answering. And uh, I think I know the answer, but I'm sure you're going to explain it much better than me. Why are no lemurs in Africa today, in the continent per se? Yes. Now, I, I said that lemurs have been in Madagascar for maybe 65 million years, which is a very, very long time. But we have some animals that look somewhat like lemurs on, on the continent, the largest continent of Africa, that lived a long, long time ago. Maybe, you know, also millions and millions of years. But they went extinct. All the lemurs went extinct on the on the main mainland, and that's probably because about 25 million years ago, the monkeys evolved. The monkeys are very smart, and very uh, many of them very manipulative, and I think they uh, started outwitting the lemurs and getting all their food and probably torturing them a little bit. You know how monkeys are. And uh, so anyway, they drove them into a, we hypothesize. We don't know for sure, of course, but we hypothesize that the monkeys, the evolution of monkeys probably drove them into extinction. Um, what are your three favorite lemurs and why? Oh, it's so hard. To, I know, I know. It's like asking a, a father about their children, right? Or a mother. Right. Well, I dearly love the Shafakas because they're absolutely so beautiful. But then I discovered this new species to science, the golden bamboo lemur. And so it's a beautiful lemur and I love them too. And then of course the mouse lemur, the world's smallest mouse lemur, is so cute. It's, it'll sit right in the palm of your hand. Oh, but I forgot the eye eye. I absolutely love the eye eye. It's this weird looking animal, a lovely animal in its own way. Um, and I brought the first uh, pair into the United States. And so I'm responsible for all the eye eyes that are now in zoos. And that's a very strange animal too. So, oh dear, I said four, didn't I? And you asked for three. <laughs> okay. I could go on and on because there's so many that are so great. Uh, what is the biggest lemur out there in terms of yeah, the its Indy. size? And he is a beautiful animal, seven, eight kilos, which is what, 12 or so, or 16, 18 pounds. And it's black and white, with green eyes and fluffy ears, you know, like, like panda bear ears. And, and almost no tail. And long legs that you know can jump in. But the most important thing about the injury is the call. I mean, the call is just beautiful. It's just like a like a clarinet, or it's it's and they call to each other every morning. What a great alarm clock! You come to Madagascar. That's uh, you'll hear it. Uh, uh, what do lemurs eat? What is their diet? In general, obviously, but... They're vegetarians, most of them. I mean, most of them are eating, you know, fine fruits that they find in the forest and, and you know, salad, you know, really nice uh, new leaves. And But some of them eat insects. The smaller ones also eat insects. But their, uh, their diets look it's, looks tasty. I haven't actually, you know, eaten what they're eating all day long, but... It's the cyanide-filled bamboo that is probably the most dangerous for humans. And, and, and something that it's in the back of my mind while I was preparing for this interview is what is the current uh, conservation status of the lemurs in Madagascar? And how many lemurs are left in the world today, if we have an approximate number? Well, first of all, you know, lemurs are critically in danger of extinction in general. In fact, 94%, 94% of the lemurs are either critically endangered, endangered, or uh, vulnerable to extinction. That's a high percentage. I mean, that's the, the highest percentage of any mammal. And so we have to, if we're gonna have lemurs around for the future, we have to be sure to conserve them, to save their habitat, and to save all those 110 species. 
What was your second question? Uh, how many are they left in terms of yes, in yeah, numbers? Well, we have 110 different species, so it's different from the small little mouse lemurs. We have quite a few, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands. Um, but for the big ones, you know, they're down to the last th thousands. And for some of them, like the greater bamboo lemur, it's under a thousand individuals. Wow. Yeah, that's sad. And we have to work very hard to make sure that they don't go extinct. And what are today's conservation challenges for Madagascar? Uh, but also what I want to ask you is how did we get here? You know, what happened in, in this country uh, to reach this point of... Um... Yes, Madagascar is an interesting history. We don't know exactly what happened, but we can only guess. Because from, from what, we've, uh, what we can tell from the fossil record, uh, there, most of Madagascar was covered with forest and filled with lemurs. And that was, you know, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, up until 500 years ago, we had 17 species of giant lemur. And I, when I say giant, I mean giant. I mean the size of gorillas. Some of them were the size of chimps, some the size of baboons, but all of them were bigger than the ones we have today. It wasn't just the lemurs that went extinct, but all the giant fauna went extinct. So the giant predator called the big fusa, three times the size of the fusa that we have today, that went extinct. We had a giant eagle, giant uh, carnivores, hippopotamuses, turtles. There were a, a whole set of animals that went extinct after people arrived. And it was about 2,000 years ago and we, the, the people that we have here now in Madagascar arrived from Indonesia. They came from the island of Borneo, and we know that because of the genetic makeup of the people today. And for, they arrived about 2,000 BC and then uh, 2,000 years ago, and then came a boat across from Africa. So the Malagasy people themselves are a combination between Asian and African. And there's one people, one language, one island, one country. Um, but there's been a lot of destruction. And we're not sure whether it was just, it had to be something more than slash and burn agriculture because it's so extensive, the burning. And we had so many of those forests, so many of those forests were, were destroyed that now we have just a fraction of the habitat for the lemurs that we used to have. So we, those, those people lived a long time ago. So what we gotta do is we gotta start rebuilding some of those habitats. So we've been doing restoration ecology, trying to rebuild uh, corridors between fragments, trying to restore the riverbanks of uh, the big rivers. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. I have a big team, you know, of Malagasy's. We've been there for over 30 years, an amazing team of people that are reforesting, people that are, are uh, medical doctors that are helping out the people with health, uh, schools that are very important. So we have, we have a whole education committee. And of course we do biodiversity research and uh, 12 months a year. So it's a, it's a great place. I invite you, please come. I would love to. Well, I, I was I was in Madagascar a while ago. I don't know if you, if you remember, but I, I was on one of the coasts sailing from from uh, south to north uh, on on this side all the way to Aldabra. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I honestly I fell in love with the country and the people are warm and the music and and the variety. And as you say, as you describe all these lemurs and everything seems to be so strange to the eyes. Uh, that is, is very beautiful to photograph. It's, it's quite uh, captivating. And I recently discovered, and I was shocked, that it's legal to have uh, uh, lemurs as pets in some uh, states in the U.S., like in Ohio, Nevada, Florida, and North Carolina. And that's something that shocked me a little bit. So I just wanted to ask you, what is your opinion about this? Yes, well, lemurs aren't meant to be pets, you know, they're really meant to be in the wild. So 
it's very difficult to keep any primates as pets. And I know that because I actually had primates as pets. And um, so the fact that it's legal in those, only those states, so the other states, it's illegal to have lemurs as pets. And I, I think that they, they should not be pets. I know that they should not be pets. And uh, many of my friends are working to change those laws. Uh, to protect the lemurs and also to te- protect the people. I mean, a lot of times you don't understand the responsibility of having a pet like a lemur, and uh, and so then suddenly you you have one and you have there's there's a lot of uh, not just extra work but also the fact that they're so social. They want to be with you all the time, mm-hmm. and they're also wild animals, so they. They have big teeth and they can also bite you. So, you know, there's a lot of the downside of having them. But I, you know, I love lemurs, but I love them most. In the you. And we're, we're coming to an end, but I have a few more questions. Uh, Patricia, uh, what is your dream? Oh, my dream. My dream is to have Madagascar safe for lemurs in the future and to have the people of Madagascar lifted out of the poverty they're in now and actually have uh, a, a good a good life, a lifestyle in life. And so I've seen that happen to so many people in the last 30 years where they had the opportunities to get an education, get a good job, and to um, actually make a good living. And living, having lemurs and people live side by side, that's what my dream is, to make them both wildlife and, and uh, people on Madagascar are uh, happy. We, we have a, a, a wide range of, of people watching this, this channel, many from Spanish-speaking countries. And I would like to ask you, what three advices would you give to someone young or young at heart uh, who dreams of becoming a primatologist or, or working on, on, or your, on your field? What, what would you tell them? now that you've acquired all this experience? I didn't know when I started out because I had no idea that people could really follow monkeys. But now I would I would definitely read everything you can about the primates and people that have studied them. And then it, I would write to primatologists and, and tell them that you really want to study monkeys and what do they suggest? Because very often... A primatologist can help you out or has a project that uh, you might want to work on. Get field experience as soon as possible because if, uh, and then, you know, I went to graduate school and I'm happy I did. I like my job very, very much. Uh, but you don't have to get a PhD necessarily to study a primate. You can also get a master's, you can work on conservation projects. But uh, the first step, is to find out as much as you can about the animals and then contact somebody. Just write them an email. They may answer and then start you off on the right path. Thank you, Patricia. And, and we're coming to an end and I have one more question. We have a, a tradition in this channel. You know, I close all my communications with the saying, never stop dreaming. So I ask uh, my guests to take that message and suggest the audience to never stop dreaming in your own words. What would be your message uh, to whoever will watch this video in the future? Never stop dreaming because if you don't dream, nothing happens. If you're going to change the future, which I hope you will, in a better, to be a better place, uh, you have to dream about how you're going to do it. Nature is so important to all of us and it's on the brink of extinction and, and we need to do all we can to protect it. And so I dream of a future where there's natural forest, beautiful animals, and lots of people like you to there to help save them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And above all, I know you're very busy, so I really appreciate that you took the time to, to chat with me. Thank you for inviting me. This has been fun. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>